Welcome to the Don't Count Me Out podcast. This program is dedicated to stroke survivors, loved ones, and caregivers, medical professionals, and anyone interested in learning more about this devastating disease and the warriors that face it every day. Our mission is to share stroke survivor stories of inspiration and hope, form friendships and community, gain knowledge and insight, and the courage to dream and explore new avenues as we find our way back to living. So my friends, the Don't Count Me Out podcast begins right now. Yvonne Dennehy, it is so nice to meet you. I'm amazed at what technology can offer. I'm sitting in Florida and she's in Australia. Welcome to the show. Thank you and hi from Brisbane, Australia. To give an idea of what your life was like before the the stroke occurred, you were very, very busy. I was extremely busy, yes. You had a job that you really loved. I was um, working in administration for um, primary school, which I really, really enjoyed. Uh, And the hours were perfect for me because I had the children as well. So I worked um, around school hours, obviously. So it worked really well with the kids. My husband, is uh, he works in the mines. So he was flying in and out of Brisbane. So he'd be away for six days and then home for six days. So, yeah, it was juggling work and the kids and a flying in and out husband. It was almost a life like people who are in the military. You could be the wife in the family for a certain period. And then there were other times where you were both mom and dad. Yes, it did feel like that at times, yeah. There are times when it was it was hard being on my own and, and doing everything, but then the benefit was that when he was at home, he was he was there for, to do things with the kids six days in a row. So he could do things at the school and help out, and he did because that's the type of dad he is. What type of mining does he do? Well, he used to do underground, but now he's above ground. So he drives the really, really big trucks. With the type of life that you had with your husband home for six days and gone for six days and you were working full time and had four children to care for, why don't you tell us a little bit about your stroke? I think there's a lot of people who have what you had and never really thought about how The symptoms are very similar. How do you sort what it is that actually is going on? Well, I've been suffering some headaches. I thought they were migraines. I used to suffer from migraines earlier on in my life, but then they seemed to decrease as I perhaps maybe got into my 40s, maybe late 30s. So I didn't have them as often. The, in March 2020, when I was 48, I started having really bad headaches again. But they were different than any migraines I'd have ever experienced before. So I did actually go to the doctor. It wasn't my usual GP, unfortunately. I couldn't get into her. Um, so the doctor that I saw uh, just checked my blood pressure and my general health and because it's just headaches, it's something that they're not going to think is anything serious. She just recommended some painkillers. Four days later is when I had another bad headache. I just took some painkillers like I what was suggested and I was just resting on my couch in the lounge room with the TV on. I noticed that the faces on the TV were looking distorted and I had colours flashing in front of my left eye and I thought that was quite odd I'd never had that happen before but I have a friend who has aura migraines so I presumed it was something like that so I did have my mobile phone next to me and I was about to phone my friend I went to pick up my water bottle and my arm just dropped and I couldn't move it instead of phoning my friend I phoned for an ambulance that was a very wise decision they had a special name for that Thund- thunderclap headaches they call them yeah it feels like your head is just going to explode it's the, the pressure I suppose because what it was was a hemorrhage so I had a bleed 
luckily it wasn't until I was in the ambulance that I lost the rest of the left side. I couldn't move my leg. My hand on the left side started to curl up as well. So the spasticity set in straight away. A lot of it after that, I can't really remember. My poor daughter, who was 17 at the time, she had to try and contact my husband and he works with my son who had his car there. So they jumped in the car and had to drive 10 hours, I think it takes to drive back. So they drove all night to get to me. It had to be terrifying for them. Yes. The middle of the night, it's dark, it's long, and it seems to me a lot of very flat land with not much around. Yeah, that's correct. It's um, outback is where he works, is what we call it in, in Australia. It's outback Australia, yeah. And so there's a lot of um, kangaroos on the road of a night as well. Oh, so they're, yeah. they're a bit of a hazard if you manage to hit one of those. Yeah. yeah. They made it. I do remember my husband arriving. He tells me now that they said to him, we don't know if she'll come through this. Um, it seemed it's the biggest bleed they had seen for quite some time. They told him, we don't know if she'll remember you and what her deficits will be if she survives. Do you remember where they said where in your brain that the stroke had taken place? Yeah, so it's the right frontal lobe. It affected my heart whole left side mobility my speech was very slurred very slow and I had a, a left side facial droop as well but as far as thinking goes were you able to think clearly my thinking I think everything was just slow everything just slowed right down I felt as if life had told me I was I'd been moving too fast and doing too much and I had to slow down when you first had the stroke the pain was really intense, very sudden. Yes. I had a hemorrhagic stroke as well. I didn't have the pain. I, I don't I know why. Everyone is different. Exactly. When you see or hear things that are really out of the norm, like watching faces on a television program begin to change and twist on you, don't ignore that. Don't think you mm. can wait till the next morning. That's Be right. Smart. Be smart. Yeah. Were they ever able to discover what had caused the stroke? No, I have never pinpointed what it was. All they can guess is that it was a, a vessel of some sort that had burst and because of the scarring and everything that's left there now, they can't really see the damage or the or the vessel that caused it yeah which is frustrating you live a pretty regimented clean life you don't drink you don't smoke you exercise no. you were so yeah. young too to be 48 and have a, a stroke like that when you had your stroke COVID had just entered the picture so we all know where we were when that happened and how it changed mm. our lives for a couple of years what what happened to you during that time? You were hospitalized, correct? Yeah, I had two weeks in hospital, but by the time I was moved to a rehab hospital, that's when COVID hit and everything locked down. So basically my husband drove to the rehabilitation hospital when I was transferred there. He said goodbye to me. I was getting wheeled in on the bed and they took me up to my room and I could just see him by FaceTime then. So I was on my own. Yeah. I'm thinking of your children, even with the older children, not being able to have time with their mother to just talk to her or have, the, have them be reassured by you. That personal touch is so important. It did affect them greatly. In the rehab hospital, I still couldn't have visitors and it was Mother's Day. I was allowed to get wheeled down to the bottom level I could wave to them through the window. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was my mother's day. You know, we spend so much time talking about the stroke survivor and, and the spouse, but I wonder if hospitals, because I, I know nothing about the way the hospitals operate in Australia, and I only know from my experience with the hospitals here in America, I don't recall anyone 
offering anything for the family or the children to help them process what had just happened. Yeah, that's correct. They weren't offered any help, actually. So my now 20-year-old, who was 17 at the time, she rode in the ambulance with me to hospital. And when we got to hospital, she was actually put into a room on her own while they assessed me. So she found that really traumatic. So she didn't know what was going on and nobody sort of communicated to her. Oh, gosh. But then you've got COVID. So, you know, things have been totally different from the way that they actually did respond. When you get home and your children and your husband are there, did the way they treat you, was that different? Were they afraid you were going to break in half, like Humpty Dumpty? Well, because we had no answers to why I had a stroke, I myself found I I was very anxious in hospital, not just because of having a stroke, but because of being away from my family, because I'm always the one who's basically there for our kids emotionally. They seem to always come to me with their problems. And the week prior to my stroke, all four of my children had (laughs) rung me with, you know, some problem. And I used to take on their problems and try and think, I used to think, oh, I've got to help them solve this. When I had the stroke, I kind of thought it was stress straight away because I did feel like the weight of the world was on me leading up to the stroke. So when I did come home, my husband had spoke to them all and said, maybe give mum a bit of a break. (laughs) (laughs) talk to talk to dad instead of mum for a bit with your problems they did reach out to dad a little bit more than me for a while I approach things differently now when they come to me with problems I don't take it on as my problem and I need to solve it for them be there for them and give them some advice and then try and put it in the back of my mind and leave it up to them which is what I should have been doing I think in the end it all comes back To us, like, as I said, with stress, it was the way I took on their problems. It wasn't the fact that they had problems and brought them to me. It was the way I was managing it. The loneliness for you during that had to be very difficult. Um, The the loneliness um, while I was in rehab, it was the weekends that were worst for me. Fortunately, during the week, With all the therapy and recovering from stroke, you need your rest anyway. During the Monday to Friday, it wasn't too bad. And I I would just FaceTime and phone calls, etc. So in one respect, it did give me that time to focus on my therapy. Um, But it was the weekends I struggled because the weekends there was no therapists there. That would have been the time that would have been perfect to have visitors. But because I couldn't, I just threw myself into the exercises that I'd been taught. Nighttime was really hard. A lot of times I'd be very anxious and I'd end up calling my husband and... (laughs) We'd chat on the phone of the night and he, he'd started sending me noise apps, so the sound of water, birds chirping, that type of thing, just to try and help me calm down and try and relax and get that sleep that I needed. But, yeah, that, that was difficult. I think people are beginning to realise that it's a process and part of the process, because so much was taken away from you so suddenly that you have to figure out what, the heck happened to you yeah and and yes. you have to go through a grieving process because some of what was taken from you may never come back and you did not give anyone permission to take you away from yourself yeah definitely when I was in rehabilitation emotionally I was sad confused and angry I suppose would be the emotions that I had then it wasn't until I got home, I think, is when the grief started, that loss of my life, how it was before, the loss of function. Yeah, and you're, you're right, you, you battle your way through it and it can take quite some time to get through all the emotions you need to go through before you start to come out the other side and you think, oh, I'm feeling a lot better and then you go down again. It's not a straight line at all. It's, Mm -hmm. yeah, I call it a roller coaster. It it really is a roller coaster. You mentioned with with having 
friends around the exhaustion that happens. I think sometimes our friends don't realize if there's too much conversation or busyness, it all gets jumbled and I have yeah. a hard time sorting through it. Does that yes. happen to you too? Yeah, it feels very overwhelming. Especially I find going out to the shops, it took me a long time to go out to shopping centres. Somebody walked past me, I'd feel uneasy and unsteady. And it, yeah, and the noise, people talking, the busyness of everything with the group of friends, it's concentrating on people's words and trying to process it. And then you're talking to someone else and they might have an accent or, yeah, it's very draining afterwards. It's very tiring because you're trying to process so much information and so much noise. When you're in a facility, like a rehab facility, you're used to a room that's very small, the ceilings are very low, the lighting is very low, the colors are all beige, on beige, on beige, and everything seems to look about the same. And then all of a sudden, when you get back out to the real world, things are larger than what you can accept. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's very true. The other thing I found interesting when I was reading through your bio was when they did send you to the rehab center, there were no other stroke survivors there for you to talk to. There was one that had just left. Apparently he had very similar to me, but there was a big difference between him and I. He went out in a wheelchair because he wasn't interested in the therapy. He didn't. He was just too overcome with his emotions to concentrate and put an effort into his therapies. I'm not sure what his story was, but yeah, the therapists all said that I was I had a better outcome because of my attitude and the way that I put myself into doing everything that was suggested and, and even more. But no, all the other people were a lot older than me and they were recovering from injuries and operations and things like that. So it would have been nice to have somebody there who had been through it and could tell me what to expect because, yeah, I had no idea what was to come. You had a wonderful medical team. How did they help you through this? What, uh, because you do have such a positive attitude some of the things that I've seen that you have done I'm I'm just amazed I think in a couple more years you're going to be even better than you are right now and you're pretty darn good right now oh thank you I think I was really fortunate that the physiotherapist that I had in the rehab hospital she was a young bubbly young girl who used to live in Tasmania as well so we had a bit of a connection there but she had just such a great positive personality and we clicked. We got on like a house on fire. We laughed a lot and I think that is important, not take everything so seriously all the time and doom and gloom. Yeah, I looked forward to my therapy, <laughs> which is really odd, but yeah. She made it fun and enjoyable. And that carried on once I left the centre. I found my amazing team that I have at Body Smart Health. Just love to have a laugh with me. So it's it's finding the right people that you connect with and that make it enjoyable. You can't leave your humour behind. And it really helps to have a therapist that you look forward to seeing because you don't want to have one that you're loathing to go, you don't want to go. It's a hard experience, obviously, doing therapy and and gym, et cetera, but you also want to enjoy it with the person who's helping you. They're not going to let you sit around, that's for sure. Music was a big motivation for you. With exercise, I've always had to have music to exercise. I cannot, even the treadmill, especially a treadmill, I cannot go on the treadmill without music and I, it has to be a certain beat. It has to go with my step. And, and yeah, that, that started right in the, the rehab centre as well. I just put music on and that just motivated me to try and move to the beat because that's what my body used to naturally do. So I just tried to restore that. Talk about ballet. Every Saturday morning. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, called Ballet for Brains. So it's ballet for people with brain injuries organised by the Queensland Ballet Company. It is wonderful. Yeah. 
it's like we do the actual ballet, but it's obviously modified. But, yeah, we have the bar and we do our plies and we do lots of stretching and we, at the end, we do a little sequence and we're actually going to the ballet in a couple of weeks to watch one of the, their professional shows called Giselle. I've never been to a ballet because I've been doing this program. It's interested me. Even my husband comes along on Saturday mornings and he joins in, which oh, <laughs> oh, he's, never, he's never been interested in ballet whatsoever. After our ballet class, myself and another participant and her support worker, we all sit down and have a um, bit of a chat and a a cuppa and a catch-up afterwards and we always have a great laugh. The actual ballet session starts at 10, goes to 11, but we never leave before 1 o'clock because we just, (laughs) we have a great time. That's nice to hear because right after your stroke, some of the friends that you had that you had been very close to started to drift away. Yeah, yeah. That was something that was probably high on the list of being difficult and hard to process and get through the emotions of that. I tried to fight for to keep their friendship for a long time and I've now realised I probably shouldn't have put so much effort into that because if they wanted me in their life, they would be there. I think it was because of the lack of understanding. I think they just saw me and thought, well, it's just your arm and your hand that doesn't work, you know. They see what's on the outside, but if you haven't been through it yourself, you don't realise what's going on internally, you know, the social aspect of being overwhelmed, you know, social gatherings and going shopping and going to the movies, the things that we used to do before. Um, So because I was now a lot different and they didn't understand, and, um, yeah, they took a bit of a step back. And I think at one stage I went through a lot of depression. So I suppose I wasn't the happiest person to be around. Yeah, a couple of friends just couldn't cope with that. What advice would you give? Because I'm sure that there's a number of other families or survivors who've been very close to people and had the same thing happen. What kind of advice would you offer to the friend? Understanding what they need, I think, is a really good way of putting it because understanding what they're going through is not probably going to ever happen. If you want to catch up with someone, ask them what time works best for them. Mornings aren't always the best time for me. I I sort of had to say breakfast doesn't work and it'd have to be later in the day, but not too late because then I get tired. So you you sort of, Mm -hmm. especially in those early, early years and early months, let the stroke survivor tell you what is working best for them at that time because it will change. I think that's another thing that friends need to realise, that it's not always going to be the same. Um, It will get better, but it will take time. I think that's the biggest thing is to give that person time. That's great advice. Maybe rather than getting together with four or five people at one time, make it a one-on-one. I agree. This does happen to some stroke survivors. You began to have, um, I can't think of the word, Seizures? Yes. Again, that happened during lockdown. (laughs) Oh, no. Yes. So apparently when the brain is healing, and especially after it's been a hemorrhagic stroke, yeah, yeah, there is a a chance of developing seizures, which I wasn't expecting because nobody told me that there wasn't that possibility. But that was, um, yeah, I was told that that was because as the brain heals and the neuro neurons start firing in your brain, if they hit that scar tissue where you've had the stroke, it will misfire and that's what causes a seizure. Now, do, had you ever been an artist before or did you just learn this afterward? I always had a little bit of creativity. I would help my children with their artworks and arts and crafts and things. But it wasn't until a couple of years before my stroke, we have where I used to work at the school, it's called a professional development day. Usually those days are for the the teaching staff and support teachers and administration officers. The principal we had at the time decided that we needed something that would bring enjoyment for the staff and bring back a bit of staff morale. So she organised an art day 
we were taught how to draw our own portrait based off the photo of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that day immensely. I loved it. But I never pursued it after that. After my stroke, I've been trying to do so many different things because you're told the more you work your brain, the more pathways that you will get ignited, etc. So I was just thinking to myself one day, oh, what could I try? And I thought about that day that we did the art. I found myself an art teacher and she comes once a fortnight. She's taught me different strokes and the mixing colours and things like that. Even in between her sessions, I would just paint whatever I was thinking or feeling and found I enjoyed it. She, she was actually here this morning and she's um, uh, found an art gallery that w- is going to display my work and it will be for sale. Um, she's building me a website so that I can put my artwork on there with my bio of my story and, and um, hoping that people will find find inspiration from not only the fact that I've found this gift after having a stroke and a change in my life, but also from what I put into my paintings because I, I try to put inspirational, optimistic, uplifting things in it that show oh, that you know, there's negative sides and there's positive sides to everything. And I like to show that if you're down and out, you can come out the other side. So, yeah. Your work is really beautiful. We have some of Yvonne's pictures. She sent them to us, so we'll be able to put a full picture on there so people can really appreciate what you've been able to do. I love dragonflies, and that one just fascinates me. Uh, That one's actually for our granddaughter that will be born in a couple of months. (laughs) That is really, really special. You brought up so many good points when you were talking about this. A lot of times we get ourselves caught in thinking, I cannot go back to work. But just because you cannot do what you did before doesn't mean that you cannot find something new to do. Congratulations on your website that's coming out and the fact that people will be able to purchase some of the artwork. That is really phenomenal. Thank you. You may not ever go back to the way you were before. You, your life will be different, but you can, you've got the chance to recreate it rebuild it I call it a kind of a rebirth you can reinvent yourself the things that you didn't like about yourself before you have the chance to change it for the positive when we really think back on our lives we've always gone through passages we're not the same person that we were when we were 10 years old we're not the same person we were when we became teenagers and we were always experimenting and trying things and sorting through what we wanted to keep and what we needed to pack away as a memory and there's no reason why we cannot do the same thing now. It's just that what was taken from us was taken so dramatically and so quickly. We did not have the opportunity to give permission to make that change. And I think for some Mm. of us, that's where we find ourselves stuck. If we can continue to grow and to show a curiosity for life and figure out who we want to be now, I think that's a big up forward for a lot of stroke survivors myself included yeah definitely I try to every day put a what they call gratitude post Mm -hmm. so I say today I'm grateful for and it might be just the tiniest of things but it might be just I had a healthy dinner I I got a hug from my daughter you know it doesn't have to be some big fanfare just looking back on your day and thinking of the things that you are grateful for and I've found that a great help well I'm telling you this has been just a a wonderful time with you and I'm glad that I've been able to get to know you better what are some of the things that you're looking forward to doing that are still challenges to you now? Well, with my artwork, eventually I would like to try and use my affected arm. It won't look anything like what's behind me. It might be more abstract, but (laughs) just just to get it involved would be good. That's a goal for me. Uh, And I'd like to try 
kayaking. I just think to myself, I wonder if I could do that. But if I have a two-person one, then maybe I can stick my husband in and he can pick up the slack. I don't. And I'd like to get back to a bit more bushwalking. We used to do a lot of bushwalking. I'd like to build up my stamina, just some small bushwalks. Yvonne, thank you so much for being here with us. I wish you the best in everything you're doing. Just keep in touch. I will. Thank you so much for having me. Just remember, everybody, don't count us out. God bless. Have a great day. Bye-bye.